Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is November 2nd. It's Monday, 2020. And in this video, we're, as I mentioned in last week's uh, video, we were able to get the catalogs finally uh, generated for the upcoming sales in London taking place. Actually, one of them took place today at Bonham's There's a, a, and, a, and a couple more later on this week at Bonham's, Christie's, and Sotheby's. And uh, we, we often do these videos, and I, we're going to do something a little bit different this time around. We're going to look at some for some really rare things, but I want to focus a bit more on things that are more moderately priced that any one of you or many of you could afford to collect if you, if you, if you look carefully. Because often people sort of skim through the catalogs and they look for the major lots just to see what they are and the thing that's worth, you know, $100,000, 200000 a million dollars and all that. And, but it, it, I think it over it gives you it gives it gives the collectors the sort of a, a, a skewed view of what these auction houses sell because they sell a lot of things that are not extremely expensive are not um, untouchable by the average collector and they do all offer them and the truth is is, is the three big auction houses. When they take in a lot and they offer it for sale that's under $10,000, they tend to require uh, very reasonable estimates and reserves because they cannot afford to have past lots in the one to $5,000, $10,000 range. It takes up too much of their real estate and their selling environment to make it worthwhile, but it creates an opportunity for collectors. And I wanted to take a look at some of these today, and we're going to focus on them a bit to give you some idea what's affordable uh, uh, or buyable in the in the more, much more moderate uh, uh, you know, price ranges. Okay, and I think it'll be sort of fun to go through, and you can see what what is available. Uh, there is, of course, the uh, the uh, Imperial sale, which is taking place on the fourth in a couple of days, and these are fairly expensive things, eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand pound range, uh, which which is, is getting right up there. You know, it's, it's it's you know it's double the median household income, <laughs> on average, uh, in many cases, and and that's not that's not the thing for the average collector. But if you hop over to important Chinese works of art, which is a much bigger sale and covers a much wider range of things, they do feature some of the major lots at the top, of course. But when you dig into the catalog, it's really fun to look through and see what is in there that has sort of a reasonable estimate and you can see yourself buying it. And many of you, I'm sure, buy on live auctioneers or Invaluable or eBay and spend this kind of money from time to time uh, of some of the things we're going to look at and it'll, and it'll give you a good idea. And it's also true that a lot of dealers uh, who sell on eBay and some of these other auction platforms buy at these auctions, okay? It's, 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 it's a sort of a, a, a well-known thing because they can get pretty good buys at times. And we're going to take a look at some of those pretty, pretty good potential buys to give you an idea. One of the things I wanted to start out with is if you're a jade buyer, this is a, and, and, and remember when you sell something, if you sell something on another site, if you're a dealer, this is for the dealers out there, if you're selling something on eBay, or you're selling something on Etsy or some other auction site. If you buy it at Sotheby's, and uh, as we saw last week with the lady that had sold, they, uh, the dealer had that sold a pair of Kang Shi bowls, they actually used the photograph from the Sotheby's sale to put in the listing, okay? And uh, it could be a useful tool. And in that case, they didn't bring what they brought at the big auction house, but the big auction house price was a few years ago when the market was a little bit stronger, I think. But at any rate, you have things like this. This really nice um, uh, Qing Dynasty Huang-shaped jade uh, dragon. Uh, a very nice little jade, beautifully done. It's a pendant. It's based on a much earlier form, of course. But this was done during the Qing Dynasty. It's a lovely piece of stone. It's, it looks nice and old. It's got nice russet inclusions in it. And it's estimated pretty modestly at one to 2,000 pounds. All right? There's something that if, if you can't afford the, uh, the Warring States jades and the, and, the, and the Eastern Han jades and all those early jades, this is something that's absolutely lovely, very nice, and, and is, is an antique. Okay, and then hop over here to this. This is a really, really lovely Daoguan Markin period saucer. Okay, it is about five inches in diameter, beautifully painted, estimated at four to 6,000 pounds. All right, and then, while that's not a small amount of money, it's certainly nowhere near what the, some of the other lots in this catalog are going to bring, but it's beautifully decorated. And if you're buying Chinese porcelain because you admire and really appreciate the art, this would be a great purchase for somebody. I love the insects in the sky, the way the flowers are done, the shading of the enamels are beautifully done. And owning a few of these in your own collection also teaches you a great deal about how to identify and authenticate other examples you might encounter someplace else where maybe the uh, scholarship of the seller isn't that good. 
But these, this is a beautifully done plate, lovely outlining, light gray outlining, nicely shaded flowers, as you can see. It's just terrific, and it is marking period. And I believe the only flower in it, I think it said it has a two millimeter long hairline or something in the rim, which if you, if you look at things on eBay and other sites all the time, that's just the way things, most things are. People assume also because things are in a major auction house, they never have damage. And you're always surprised to get the damage, you know, as the condition reports find, oh, yeah, this thing's been restored. They do sell things like that, and they don't, not everything they sell is perfect. But this is a lovely example for 46,000 pounds, which means the reserve is probably down around two or 3,000 um, pounds, and most likely. So it's something worth looking at. And then over to this. This is lovely. This is a, one of these uh, Jai Jing Markin period dragon bowls. Uh, it's a well-known pattern. They made lots of these. They made these in the Qinlong period. They made them in the in the Jai Qing period. They made them in the Dalguan period. But a beautiful example. It was very, very popular. And this is a beautifully done example. Uh, often uh, the uh, the uh, Jai Qing examples are indistinguishable from the Qinlong ones. And and the reason is is that they made them in both periods and the uh, the style of making them and so forth. Just because one rain ends and a new rain begins doesn't mean that they suddenly overnight begin making things entirely differently and you see many cases of this in the world of porcelain and bronzes and jades that something a style that they were making during Qinlong's period continued to be made pretty much exactly the same into the into the next period it's not unusual and this is this is a lovely lovely bowl I love the way the iron red decoration is done on it nice soft translucent aubergines uh, the conch shell at the top here and uh, nice clear yellows and all that that we like to see on these bowls and a beautiful example it's estimated at four to six thousand pounds all right and it's a lovely lovely example the mark is perfectly done and uh, there you go Nice thing, nice thing. And let's face it, we cover things that sell for a lot more than this on eBay with some considerable regularity. Then over here to this. This is nice. This is a, a fish form Tang Dynasty Senkai glazed uh, oil lamp. It's a nifty item. These are very interesting. They're not very big. They're just, you know, th four or five inches or so long. It is, how big is this? Five inches long, five and a quarter inches long, but has a very, very nice glaze. It's got this nice uh, amber yellow uh, splashed into it that you want to see. It is in lovely condition all the way through from the photographs. I'd always get a condition report, but a beautiful example. And it has an eight to 12,000 pound estimate. But for a fish form Tang Dynasty piece, uh, which is a, a very, very well done with a lovely glaze. If you could own one piece of Tang pottery, you know, own one good piece of Tang pottery. And that's what this is. It's just a nice, nice example. And then over here to this is this very nice Guangxu period. Uh, 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 it is marking period. Uh, uh, red and uh, underglazed blue bowl. And if you pull it in, you can see that it is just very, very nicely decorated. The the cobalt on it, the cobalt decoration is excellent. The red decoration on it is uh, very, very clear, very crisp. All of the outlining is very good. It's an immortals bowl. These bowls were very popular in the Guangxu period, and they made a fair number of them. So they're not worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they're just very nice. I, lo I love this central figure, uh, the little on with the peach riding on the back of the Kirin. And, uh, and there's another fellow coming along here riding on the back of an elephant and so forth. And he's, he's presenting a double gourd bottle with this, uh, uh, with the mist with the, with the coming up out of it, presenting another figure riding a dragon. Uh, just lovely. And it is estimated at 1,500 to 2,500 pounds. There you go. Just a, a very, very nice example. And um, uh, it is eight inches in diameter. And uh, the condition on it is a uh, crescent-shaped ring firing line in the foot in a few disturbed areas around the rim. So it's got some minor rim blemishes, and it's got a, a little firing line in the foot, which is pretty common on these bowls. If you've seen a lot of condition reports, you often see things like uh, line and foot, chip and foot, something in the foot. Uh, it's very, very common. All right, even on the top end pieces, not just not just uh, things that are more regular. But this has a very nice red on it. I, I particularly like it, and the brush strokes are nice and even. Good example. And then over here to this, if you're a rock crystal collector, this is probably was probably made in the second half of the 19th century. It's fairly complicated carving of rock crystal. But what a superb piece of rock crystal. Looks like it has a brush washer built into it, and you have the phoenix, and then you have a chimera climbing up one side. Beautifully, beautifully uh, proportioned base in the center with a dragon head lid. This is a lovely thing. Really, really is. 
absolutely great. And the estimate on it is very reasonable, 1,500 to 2,500 pounds. So I assume I'm going to, if I, I don't know what the reserve is, but I'm going to bet the reserve is somewhere around 1,000 a thousand pounds. And uh, you'd certainly, uh, if this was on eBay, you'd certainly think that was more than reasonable. Here it is at Sotheby's. It's in good condition as far as I know. And it is, how big is this? Five five inches long. So it's it's a nice table, to- table object size. The rock crystal looks to be an, a, a very, very high grade. It's nice and clear. If you look at rock crystal uh, and you see these nice clear pieces like this, it's quite desirable. And the fo- finish and polish on this is very good. It's almost like uh, jade. Uh, especially if you look at the faces of, 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 of the phoenix and the dragon or the chimera. It's really lovely, beautiful example. All right. And then we'll head over over to this thing. This, I think, is, is, is I get a condition report on this, but I've had, a lot, I've had a number of these vases and have gotten more money than this. They estimate at three to 5,000 pounds uh, for this very nice Guangxu period uh, Celadon ca- uh, Kong. And what's really nice about this Kong is the color of the, of the glaze is absolutely lovely. The color of the glaze on this is excellent. You notice it's nice and thick and darkens at the base of the neck from all the pooling and bubbles in the glaze. And the trigrams down the side are very neatly aligned, beautifully done, uh, absolutely lovely. All the way to the bottom, it has a nice splayed foot on it, and it is mark and period. There's the mark. And as I've said many times about Guangzhou pieces, most of the Guangzhou pieces or pieces you see with Guangzhou marks were not made in that period. They were made slightly after. Uh, uh, 90% of the, 90, 95% of the Guangzhou mark pieces you're going to come across on the market are not mark and period. They were made later, but done in the same general generation or era as the originals. All right, but with a three to five, there is a good look at the mark, okay? And you can see how the, the cobalt popped a little bit here. This is normal on these, these dark areas. It almost looks like heaping and piling, and it's just where the cobalt pushed through the glaze a bit during the firing process. Very typical. Three to 5,000 pounds is not unreasonable for that. If I were going to be putting it on another site, on, a, on, a, on an eBay website uh, for sell or something, I wouldn't be surprised to see it bring eight or 10, uh, 10 or $15,000, but it's a nice one. And then over to this, your scholar's pot collector, the uh, scholar's brush, uh, brush pot collector, scholar's objects. This is terrific. This is a late Qing example also, late 19th century, but it is a Z-Tan brush pot, all right? And I think the estimate on this is crazy low. This is a really, really lovely brush pot, beautifully carved, with cl- very deeply carved with dragons and clouds and so forth. It's got a nicely, nicely edged little uh, uh, ring around the base with a, with a step down of sort of a semi V-shaped form foot on it. Very, very nice piece. Estimated at eight to 1,200 pounds. Okay, think about that. Eight to 1,200 pounds for this, very reasonable. And it's a typical size of one of these. It's seven and three quarter inches tall. So it's a nice size, looks to be in very good condition. And you can you could you, you have a shot at buying it potentially for for a very reasonable amount of money. If the low estimate is eight hundred pounds, the reserve is probably around five or six hundred six hundred pounds. Quite reasonable. You want to check these sales out. I'm just saying. All right, leave a bid for heaven's sakes. These are the kind of things that later on you go, oh my God, that was so reasonable. Don't forget there is a buyer's premium, of course. All right, and then you have a Qing Bai lamp, Song Dynasty. This is a nice piece of Qing Bai. Beautifully stepped, very thinly decor- very thinly potted. If you examine these uh, lower sections here, these little dish sections, the glaze is quite good. There's a little bit of browning in here that you see, which you don't typically see on the highest end pieces of Qing Bai. But lovely form, rare form, all right? And if, you're, if you like rare forms, this is quite a rare form. All right, very, very superbly potted all the way up. The shaping on it was great. The glaze on it is quite good. It's not as, as blue as some pieces of Jing Bai, but it's a very nice looking piece, almost like Tang whitewares, that kind of thing, with a three to 5,000 uh, pound estimate for a nice Sung Dynasty lamp. And these are small. These tend to be four and a half inches tall. It's not a big 10 inch thing, but if you like early, early ceramics, this would be a lovely choice, really would. All right, and then over here to this nice Sung Dynasty Lotus Bowl, uh, beautifully done Celadon. The Celadon is not the very light, light sort of canuda green that everybody goes absolutely crazy for, and they bring, 
you know, vast amounts of money, but it's a good piece of Lung Kwan Celadon. Uh, lovely potting on it, nicely done all the way around. Uh, here's a good shot of the foot rim. The glaze is good and so forth. There's a little bit of a glaze uh, where it's separated. There's some issues along here with the glaze, the way it was fired, but it's pretty typical. Two to 3,000 pound estimate for a nice example. And this one is what, eight inches, uh, eight and a quarter inches wide. That's, that's sort of the range a lot of them are in. They use a lot of these bowls. That that This particular form bowl, most often you find in the six and a half, seven inch to maybe nine inch range, eight and a half inch range, typically. All right, plates, of course, can be, you know, big plate or all, later on, plates were much bigger. And then on to this. I think this is a great buy for somebody. These boxes, and we're going to talk more about these boxes later on, and I'm kind of surprised that they didn't mention it in the description. Uh, these, these are very nice melon-formed Juan Huali boxes, and these are typically used to hold the, uh, the pieces for, for playing Go. These are like little Go containers. And uh, you'd have two of them, one for, you know, for the opponents, and you put your white and black pieces, black pieces in one, white pieces in another, and you play the strategy game of, of Go, which we've talked, actually, it's come up a few times in the last couple of weeks. It's a very old game. It's been around for thousands of years. And uh, it's considered to be, being good at this game is sort of considered to be, you know, a, is a scholarly sort of endeavor because it requires, it's, a, it's basically chess and requires a lot of thought and a lot of, a lot of strategy, and it is a hard game to play. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, what uh, what is this estimate? Fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred pa uh, pounds for this beautiful pair of boxes, and they were probably done during the first half of the nineteenth century, from what I can see, judging by the color and so forth. And then over here to this, a beautiful pair of white glazed, uh, unwired decorated dragon balls. These are lovely, small balls, about four inches in diameter, estimated at three to five thousand pounds. But it's a pair, it's a pair. And uh, absolutely lovely. They are not marked. They're just very finely done, very elegant, quite lovely. And, uh, and for three to 5,000 pounds. All right. I think these are just terrific. They look great together on a shelf. Just add, But the potting on these, always look at the shape and the potting. Just absolutely great. And then over here to this, this is uh, one of the last things. There's several iron heads in this sale. And the thing that's interesting is that iron, iron Buddhas, iron heads, and so forth in China are quite rare. They, 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 the Chinese were not big iron producers. They did not make it anywhere near as often as they made bronzes or mixed alloys. But this is a very, very lovely uh, uh, Buddha head, finely cast, uh, late Ming dynasties, mid to late Ming dynasty. Uh, nice example. And I love the surface that iron develops on these pieces. The casting is very crisp. The eyes are beautifully done. The lips are beautifully done. The curls in the hair and so forth all the way up to the tippity top. And this is a good size figure. It's 14 inches tall. And it's estimated at six to 8,000 pounds, all right? Now it's, 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 you know, it's a little more than some of the other porcelain pieces, but this is a Ming Dynasty ironwork, which I think is incredibly underappreciated. You do not see it very often. And they have several other examples uh, in this same catalog. So if you, if you wanna try something, get something really, a real standout piece that's big, you could you know, display in your, in, in where you keep your, or keep your antiques or on a, on a shelf in your living room, this would be a really lovely thing to have and uh, just absolutely beautiful. And then over here at uh, Christie's, that was the end of the Sotheby's sale. Just, just a few things. They have a lot of things in there like that I just showed you. The Christie's sale. And as, of course, Christie's, like Sotheby's, has some very expensive things, but they also have some modestly priced things. And I would urge you to go through it. All right, and if you go through here, you're going to see some some big ticket items, but you're also going to find some fairly modestly priced things that are sort of what what a, what, what a lot of collectors could afford to uh, involve themselves in. And uh, these auction houses are more than happy to have you as a customer. I can guarantee you that. We're also going to take a look at a couple of real rarities that have turned up. They're going to be more money, but they're interesting. A couple of Yixing pieces that popped up in there. All right, this is a, a type of vase that is copied. This is another one of these Guangxu vases. Uh, that was it was heavily copied. It was very popular during the period, and then they were heavily, heavily copied, copied afterwards. There are a lot of fakes floating around of this vase. A lot of them. A lot of a lot of them. Like n n 99 out of 100 that you see on the market of this particular vase are copies. All right, but this is a real one. Beautifully enameled. Beautifully decorated. We can really pull it in here with this tool they give you. Uh, there's the dragon. Notice the shading around the face of the dragon, the way the hair wisps back, 
the 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 scales on it. I like the scales in particular because they, the artists did them so that the, some of the, the scales are bigger and larger and smaller than others. Nicely done. And here's the inside of the back leg, all beautifully filled in. These very muscular talons coming off of the dragon, and then the lovely shading of uh, red, yellow, and blue on the on the clouds floating around it, and then of course the uh, the the, the lappet base, this very typical pattern that you see on late 19th century porcelains, not just imperial pieces, in, in court pieces and so forth, but on on you know everyday vases, and. Uh, a very, very nice piece. And the estimate on it is in the $6,500 to $10,000 range U.S. They do bring more at times. We've seen these bring fifteen and 20000 But this is a good size face. This face is 15 inches tall with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a five to 8,000 pound or $6,500 to $10,000 U.S. estimate, which means the reserve is probably around $5,000 which would be an absolutely amazing buy if you wanted to go after it. And again, this is one of these cases where you build up a list of a lot of things that are moderately priced and then chase them down, then chase them down. And this is something that's quite rare. It's got a bigger estimate this time around. It's a very, very rare type of Yixing uh, brush washer where they mix sand. It's, the form is absolutely like art modern. And they, and they put, but they, they, when, they, when they use the uh, Yixing clay, they add little flakes of sand into it to give this effect so that it, at a distance it almost looks like gold dust. But this is a nice example, very unusual form, uh, really, really lovely, and it's early Qing Dynasty, so uh, first half of the 18th century with a 30 to 50,000 pound estimate, but beautiful, and it is signed uh, by, by the artist, um, uh, Hu Men Chen. And uh, if, you, if you're a Yixing pottery collector, you can look him up, and there's his seal mark on the bottom. Beautifully stamped in, a lovely example, a really lovely example. And then the next next piece of Yi Ching that I just wanted to share was this. This is a fantastically rare piece of uh, Yi Ching where it's a, it's a it's a it's an inkstone, uh, but the top of it painted in this pattern. There's one very very similar to it in the National Palace Museum collection. It's, it's considered to be one of their best pieces of Yi Ching, and this is another one. The decoration on it is out, outstanding and absolutely uh, fabulous. Uh, this, this beautiful lacquer work, the bat, the bat outlines, and then these, 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 this wild uh, interior work. It looks almost like uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, lacquer and enamel work you see in Italy from about the same period, and then these beautiful out, this beautiful framing around it, sort of a rococo framing, but very, very nice. It has a big estimate, seventy-eight to one hundred and four thousand dollars U.S. But I wanted to share it. It's from the Yongchen period. Just a great thing. Just a, a great 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 rare form of Yixing it's not you know you're so used to seeing the teapot I thought it'd be fun to share something that was very different and in this catalog that's over on the bookshelf over at Bitamount you can go in you can flip through and there were several other very very rare pieces of Yixing they obviously came out they all came out of one collection but this is a particularly rare form and it is uh, these are not very big they're like seven eight nine inches wide there it is all right but a good thing, just a great thing. And now let's get back to some things that are a little uh, less fancy. And you come along to things like this bronze. Uh, a very, very nice example, Ming Dynasty, 16, uh, you know, uh, made uh, in the late uh, 1500s, early 1600s, uh, you know, one Lee period, somewhere in there. But a beautiful bronze, nicely done, um, sort of a flask form with mask handles on the ends. Uh, a, here's a picture of the mask. There it is. Okay, and uh, a nice deep patina. And as I as I said, on some other bronzes, sometimes people oil them. This one has been oiled. I would I would wipe it off and let it dry out a bit. But it's up to you. And fifty two hundred to sixty five hundred dollars U S. or four to five thousand pounds, which which means again, you know, sort of take ten twenty. If you want to get an idea what the reserve on it is, you probably can take ten twenty percent off. Some reserves on some of these are probably unreserved. Or close to it, you know, maybe a thousand pounds or something. So, like I said, register for these auctions, leave a bid, leave a bid. All right, and then you get onto this another good piece of Guangzhou porcelain. This one I think is is also very underestimated. Uh, this is a particular type that uh, uh, that turns up on the market. Uh, they make lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of these. This one's a real one. And what's very nice about this are, are two things. One, the cobalt is a very dark blue. It's very, very dark. It's a beautiful dark blue cobalt. And in the right light, it would probably look like Femme Noir, would look black. 
But the other thing that's great about this is that the gilding is in spectacular condition all the way down to here. And often these lappets, there's that pattern of lappets again that we just saw that was in Famille Rose. This time it's in gilding. And uh, it's, it's nice and clean. There's no wear to it. And often the gilding on the bottoms of these vases, for some reason in this area in particular, get worn as they do on the outer edges, the furthest out sections around the equator. Uh, for some reason, they tend to wear. This one, the, the gilding on it looks absolutely great all the way up the body all the way up the body and the detail work you know the trigram up here and then the flowers and the rosettes and the bamboo and the birds all very very nicely done and the only hint of wear on the top of this that i can see right away is right here is the upper rim um, some of the gilding is worn off now keep in mind that people kept flowers in these and this is where any activity for this vase this vase apparently happened was right around the top and uh, this also is a good size one. It's 15, all, most of these are 15 inches to 16 inches in height. And it's estimated at six to 8,000 pounds. And I don't think that's a terrible price. And it is mark and period. All right, there's the mark on the bottom. Very, very nice. And they do provide a very good shot of the foot rim and what the foot rim on one of these pots should look like. And you want to learn about these. You notice how it's slightly beveled. It's flattened on this side. And then it's flat, you know, bevel, splays out on the sidewalls, flat, sort of a flattish base to it, slightly rounded, hand trimmed, and then all hand trimmed around the interior. And this nice, deep, dark blue in the bottom. They didn't shine enough light here on the bottom so that you could see the mark easily, but they do provide a nice picture of the mark. And there it is. And there, here you are again with little bits of the cobalt pushing through the rain mark, uh, through the glaze on the base uh, that occurred during the firing. But beautifully done beautifully beautifully done and and you know not a crazy price not in the you know not in the million dollar range for a good piece of porcelain the same for this this Daisai uh, yellow ground decorated jardinere with the the famous inscription on it and these beautiful grisaille decorated flowers all the way around it and of course this pattern was a famous uh, a favorite of the empress dowager and it is believed that she helped design this pattern and it typically comes in yellows and turquoise is the primary ground colors on these this is a yellow example nice and brightly done um, some of these were done when they were first done that she used them as gifts and uh, this is a beautiful example, and uh, it is estimated at five to eight thousand pounds, or six to ten thousand uh, dollars U.S. Uh, of a nice, nice example. And this is fairly good size; it's ten inches in diameter. Looks to be in very good condition. Lovely example, and. Um, the uh, Diasai uh, name comes from the uh, studio of the great empress. Which, mean, which again implies that she was involved with, the, with its, its implementation and design. You know, she may have sort of come up with it and worked, you know, the way people, you know, famous people have uh, ghostwriters. She may have approved of it or guided them in the process. I don't know all the particulars. And then over here to this, these are splendid. This is a pair of Daozai uh, Meiping vases. Uh, highly unusual, very, very unusual. And these may sell for a reasonable price because they're not something you're gonna see very often. And I love the red-headed herons um, that they've, they've sprinkled into the clouds. They're all over the place. And you don't notice them right away when you first look at it. And then when you zoom it in a bit, you see them. But beautifully done, and beautifully done how they sort of attenuate themselves up through the clouds. And I like the color combinations that they use, the, the outlining of the uh, uh, iron, sort of iron red, and then this beautiful turquoise blue. Lovely, and hints of light blue also splashed in, underglazed blue. But all in Daozai enamels. And these are decent sized vases. These are not tiny. These are 17 inches tall with an eight to 12,000 pound estimate. Okay, and they are 18th century, probably uh, 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 late Yong Chen to Chin Lung period, based on what I'm seeing, but absolutely lovely. They didn't date them particularly. They didn't get too precise in the dating because these are hard to date without, without, without a conforming rain mark or something. Uh, you know they're 18th century, but when in the 18th century? Here's a good shot of the foot rims on them. Uh, very, very nicely done. Uh, and you can see where the high point, the, 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 the part, the, the, low, the, the, the sharp edge of the, of the vase has gotten some nice natural wear over the years and so forth. You want to see that. <clears throat> Ten to fifteen thousand dollars US, okay? Uh, and these are big, 17 inches in height. And then we go over to the last of the Christie's lots, and we're going to head into Bonhams for a few minutes, is this. If you're a Ming buyer and you like Ming figures, Ming statues, this is a great one. It is 13 inches tall, 
beautifully done, you know, very, very naturalistically modeled. And this guy has such a great face. This guy has a fantastic face. If you like gilt bronzes from the Ming Dynasty, you want to look at this. This is a nice example, and it's sort of an unusual one. You're not going to see this very often because they didn't do a lot of, a lot of full standing statues uh, sort of of this type. And this is a beautiful one. I love the face on the guy. He looks sort of quizzical, kind. Um, his, 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 his body position uh, looks like he may have had something in his hands at one point. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. And then he's wearing a classical Ming Dynasty belt, which is very interesting because this is what Ming belts look like with these, with these rondelles on top of a very thick leather strap. And then nicely, uh, nicely folded out robes. And then his boots, of course, with his pant legs coming down and standing on a rocky plinth. Just, just a nice package all the way around. Five to eight thousand uh, pounds, UK. Uh, not a horrifyingly high price. A beautiful example. And as I said, it's 13 inches tall, so it's over a foot tall. This is a nice statue. You know, imagine having this and that and that uh, Ming iron head, which was uh, uh, around the same size. Having a collection of these things, they're just lovely. And um, like I said, these are things that are not insanely uh, estimated uh, so that it would, it would you, know, you know, keep your kids from going to college. All right, now let's take a look over here at the bottom sale. Um, this is a fine Chinese art and so forth. Uh, you have this, this very nice Junyao bowl. And I think this one was originally sold by Sparks, right? John Sparks Limited. Uh, a very nice uh, uh, bowl. There we go. Let's, uh, can we blow that up a little? Yeah, there we are. All right, very nice Jun Yao glaze. Notice how thick it is down here at the bottom. Uh, nicely trimmed uh, paste on the on the on the end. And what was interesting about this bowl was that the interior was not glazed. And I found this very interesting. Uh, you don't often see these with unglazed centers. If I can get the thing to load, there it is. There's the inside of it. This is sort of an unusual feature: unglazed interior. It's not the foot rim, that's the inside. And what I like about it is that you can see the turnings, you can see the work, and you get a real sense of how thick these Junyao glazes could be on this inner edge. You see how thick it is, okay? And uh, just a, a very, very nice example uh, for a person shopping with a somewhat modest example, a modest amount of money with a two to three thousand pound estimate. Yan Dynasty. Uh, these were often thought to be sung for forever. They were only sung, and now they're finding out, of course, a lot of these Jun Yao pieces are, are Yuan and, and into the Ming Dynasty. But this was a nice, nice little bowl with a modest estimate. And then you have this, these two lots. This is a great lot, three to five thousand pounds. A Junyao uh, jar and a Junyao bowl, and I love the jar. I like the jar. Well, the bowl is very nice too. It has a good-looking rim on it. Um, uh, nicely done, nice shape, good potting, and this too. Very nice glaze on it with these very delicately placed loop handles, and then the creamy, you know, the creamy buff upper section section you see on these because the blue tends to run down and leave this sort of clear uh, straw-colored uh, glaze up above. But just a nice, nice two examples, and you know, reasonable three to five thousand pounds for both of them. And uh, the, these are uh, the the bowl is seven inches or so in diameter or so, as I recall. Um, uh, duh, 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 uh, five and a half, oh, five and a half inches wide, and uh, I think that's the uh, the jar. And uh, and the bowl, yeah, there it is. And the bowl is eight inches in diameter. All right, so very nice little purchase, and they have provenance with them, everything. The jar um, uh, came from the uh, uh, Morphopolis collection, which is one of the most famous collections there ever was for Chinese ceramics back, back in the first half of the 20th century. And uh, there it is, three to 5,000 pounds. A lot of these great pieces came out of these, these, these a lot of great collections own things that, that aren't vastly expensive today, and you can, you can buy them for your own collection, and they still have on top of it this lovely provenance and you just want to make sure you keep those records with the piece once you buy it and then over here to this the Famil rose they call it ladies plates and so forth uh, absolutely lovely early chin lung period uh, beautiful pair beautiful beautiful pair estimated at one 1500 to 2000 uh, uh, pounds there's seven and a half inches in diameter which is about normal for these and uh, there we are. Here's, here's the page. It's got a load. You'll notice on Christie's page, by the way, when they load, it comes in sort of hazy, and then it sort of layers itself in and clears itself up as we go along. But this is a lovely pair of bowls with this black rim. We've seen these black rim bowls before. And the estimate here, if you remember, um, 
uh, about a year ago, there was a there was a one of these that turned up on eBay in the in the single black rim bowl with the lady scene on it. I think sold by itself about the same size, seven and a half eight inches, sold for around a thousand twelve hundred dollars, as I recall. And uh, here you have a pair of them uh, with an estimate that certainly aligns with that, and they look to be in very nice condition. That's the one thing about the big auction houses is that they'll that you can buy things that have fairly modest estimates and so forth which means low reserves, but they they do adhere to fairly high standards as far as condition goes, even on less expensive things. So you get a nice, nice example. And this this particularly is a beautiful pair of bowl, beautiful pair of dishes. And I love how they included the, 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 the Ming jars in it. And then you have this lovely root, sort of rooty table up here, and you have a bird, lots of stuff going on in the picture. All right, so that's something you can keep in mind, too, if you're a Chinese export collector. They do get some very nice Chinese export. And then over here to this, uh, people that like to buy animal carvings. This is a really, really nice one. This is a buffalo horn carving of a chilean, and uh, we'll get it to blow up here. This is a beautifully done example. I love the wave, so they reach up and sort of touch the bottom of his belly. The scales on them are lovely. The facial expression turning, turning around sort of alarmed, looking back behind him. Very, very nice example. Qing Dynasty, uh, absolutely great. They dated as 18th to early 19th century. These are very hard to date with any enormous amounts of precision, but very good quality. It is three and seven eighths inches tall with a two to three thousand pound estimate. Just great. And then over here to this, this gilt stupa, 18th century gilt bronze stupa. Very nice one, estimated at two to three thousand pounds. It has a lot of good detail in it, uh, and if you if you bring in the pictures, you'll see it. Beautifully done, all the way down to the flame, the top, the lower the step sections, and the lower steps, all that, and all these nice little uh, repeat patterns cast into it. Very very nice, two to three thousand pound estimate, and this was pretty decent size. Was really, remember we saw the crystal topped um, stupa the other day that was uh, somebody had in an auction over on Live Auctioneers. Here's another one, same size, six inches, six inches or so in height. Sort of the standard size of a household stupa, two to three thousand pounds. <laughs> and another really lovely pair of porcelains are these. This p fantastic pair of Yongshen period uh, the, again ladies' dishes, uh, very very nice from a, from a famous uh, from I think these were from uh, Spinx had these or something. Um, if we zoom it in a little bit here. Uh, uh, Glasgow Gallery Museum, um, the, I can't really read that, the Leonard Collection, and there was something else on them, at any rate, uh, in the collection of uh, SHS Smith. All right, so you've got three collector's labels on here, and I, figure, I think they also add the name of a dealer that had handled them. But beautiful quality, absolutely beautiful quality, the decoration on these plates. Young Shen period, blow, let's bring them in. Come on, come on, come on, load. There, let it load fully. Okay, you got a little blemish over in here, but look at the decoration. Look at the quality of the decoration in here, the facial expressions. Absolutely superb, absolutely superb. Beautiful shading of the enamels all the way down the guard barrel. You have this beautiful um, uh, elmwood table that they're seated beside, and this gilt, probably a gilt like gilt bamboo with a bronze incense burner, Ling Bai, a horsetail whisk, and all those sort of scholarly things. Just a great pair of dishes, a nice looking pair. And estimated at four to six thousand pounds, not a crazy price. And the provenances, they was oh, they were sold at Sotheby's. This was interesting. The last time they sold at Sotheby's was in uh, 1950. And um, they were, oh, these were published in Hobson's book. That's what the provenance thing was. They were published in, in, the, in the catalog of Leo Gao collection of Chinese porcelain in 1931, R.L. Hobson who was the famous uh, book writer from back then who wrote the big, thick book on Chinese porcelain. These had been illustrated by him while he did a catalog of this particular, one of, the, one of the owners of this in a collection during its life, which makes it interesting. You want to get that book, you want to get the catalog, you buy this, and you got something fun to read and something good to own. It's a nice package. All right, and then if you're a collector. And then over here to this, a beautiful pair. I don't know why, why these are so in, in, have such low estimates. 14 inches, that's right, tall. These lotus, lotus jars, beautifully done. Ming Dynasty, absolutely lovely. And if we can get them to load. Uh, for some reason, Bottoms' pages is a little slow to load. 
All right, there we go. They loaded. It's a little slow to load at times. But anyway, nice pair of Ming jars. Good size, 14 or so inches tall, I believe. And uh, two to 3,000 pound estimate. 14 and three quarter inches. Just a hair under 15 inches, you get a pair of them. Two to 3,000 pound estimate, which means the reserve is, as I said before, probably below that. Probably around fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars for both. Get a condition report, of course, but a good buy. And then over here to this, these are a bit more money than some of the other things we looked at, but these are fantastically rare. All right, these are a pair of Kangxi Femi Ver uh, based on a Dutch style or Dutch form uh, candlesticks. These are incredibly rare and beautiful, beautifully done. Uh, for, and these were made for, 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 for export, though there are some in, in, in Chinese collections. Uh, but unbelievably fantastic and if you if you if you're thinking of you know really reaching in and getting something unusual and interesting this would be it these are fascinating and they do have them in some uh, european i think the reichs museum has a pair of these um and uh i believe there's a pair of them still in china but very 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 rare type of candlestick obviously and you're looking at them you're thinking boy they look european yeah well they were made for the european market so that's sort of why but i absolutely love these they just knock me out and i think the estimate is crazy crazy reasonable 10 to 18,000 pounds though if you go to if you go to uh, look them up and find a comp to try to come up with a value it's going to be a little bit difficult there's a decent write up on them and and uh, um other examples and so forth, but there's not much else mentioned. You notice there's there's uh, there's uh, no other um, a record of the Metropolitan Museum of Art apparently has a pair, and uh, ten to eighteen thousand pounds. So if you're looking for something rare, I think this is something that is rare and reasonably estimated. And then over to this. This I'm just going to show you because this was a painting that just absolutely knocked me out. This is a great painting. It comes from an Italian collection, and it was done for the Yongchen Emperor, they believe. Well, it was based on, the painting was done um, in the Yongchen to Qinlung period, but the style and the manner in which these ladies were painted were, uh, were they believe, might have been based on a series of paintings that were done during the Kangxi period for the, for the, for his, for the prince who became Yongchen. And the, the facial expressions, the way the hair is done, the, uh, the ornaments, and they're playing again, go. And here are those, remember earlier we talked about those boxes that were used to keep the go pieces in. And I mentioned there'll be more on that coming up. Here they are. Here are two of them, that form and shape and size. They did them also on lacquer. There's a lacquer pair in this sale. They did them in wood. They did them in um, uh, uh, mother of pearl, all kinds of different ways of making them. But uh, the, this painting, I think, is just absolutely stupendous. And what's interesting about it, it's very large for a Chinese painting, uh, a Chinese portrait. And here's a, a, a portrait painting. And here's the original owner. There's a very interesting write-up on it. And it jo goes through the whole uh, history of the origins of this design of depicting women in this, this way. And this is the, uh, the, from the screen of the 12 beauties. And it's a very interesting story. And here's, here's the little... Uh, the counter box, and they showed a nice detail of it. This is obviously a lacquer one in black lacquer, but beautifully done. It's got a big estimate on it, uh, 60 to 80,000 pounds, but a fantastically rare painting. And uh, uh, you don't see them that often. And it is 60, I think it was 60 inches and um, uh, 61 inches wide over, you know, so it's, uh, it's uh, you know, just about uh, two, two yards wide almost. Well, uh, one and a half, two, one and three quarter yards wide. So it's it's a great big, great big painting and uh, um, just lovely. All right? I'm not sure I'd keep it in that frame. It looks a little fragile, but uh, beautiful example. And then over here, here's a pair of those um, uh, the Wee Wee Chi boxes that they use to hold the piece, the counting pieces in, which are very similar to the uh, Wan Wa Lee pair we saw at the very beginning. That they're over at the Sotheby's sale. Uh, big estimate, eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand. They're late Ming, early Qing dynasty. Beautiful quality, uh, and uh, you know that's what they were for. And then back to other things that are not quite so expensive. You get to things like this. This beautiful, uh, they call it a pale green russet jade horse carving, Ming Dynasty. L I love animal forms. As many of you know, I always I always talk. I love seeing horses and elephants and animals and painting in jades and on porcelains and so forth. This is a lovely one, and it's decent size. It's um, what is it? It's two inches long, which is about right for one of these little jades. 
the, the animal is quite muscular, uh, the way it's outlined and everything. The mane is beautifully done with a two to 3,000 pound estimate in this lovely russet green. And the carver did a fairly skillful job of incorporating the colors of the stone into the carving so that it sort of highlighted things, the ground being highlighted with these sort of curly, curly wave uh, ground elements. The horse tail is, is integrated into the ground because it's all obviously carved out of one piece of stone and the hoofs and so forth go down over it like his hoofs went through the, through the cloud and he was standing, this is a cloud element and I, I think this is just lovely. Two to 3,000 pounds, how do you beat that? And then lastly is this, this goo form beaker vase with chimeras. I think this also, it's nine inches tall, has a two to 3,000 pound estimate and uh, you know, this, this, if you're a Chinese bronze buyer uh, for, for Ming things and early Qing bronzes and so forth, you want to chase this. This is a nice example. This is a nice old example. Rare desirable form from a much earlier period, obviously. Beautifully done with the relief work chimeras around the midsection and an estimate of just two to 3,000 pounds. And that's it, okay? And, I, and, I, and this, as I said, this is a little bit different than the video we normally do. We normally talk about all the high price things and all that, but I thought it would be fun to take a look at an auction, the series of auctions, where it's things that, that more, more average buyers could afford to collect. It's still a little bit of money, but not the, the crazy thing that you normally see at some of the big auction houses when you're, you're talking in hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. These are all things, uh, for the most part, with a few highlights I wanted to throw in, of things that were more reasonably priced. There are, of course, some terribly, or highly, very expensive pieces in these sales, as always. But this is the, the other end of those sales that often get overlooked. And um, why do that? Enjoy it. Enjoy the stuff. All righty. Uh, we'll be back later this week. Rob Michael's sale finished. He looked like he did quite well. I, I was happy to see that. They had some nice results. And we'll do a, a video on those. On, on that sale and uh, have a good week. We'll be back later on. Thanks so much for walking, uh, watching. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do and uh, come over to bitamount.com and uh, visit us and poke around. Alrighty. Bye-bye.